Good evening and welcome. My name's Ruth Dewa Ayu and I'm the Assistant Director of Public Programs at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to tonight's first evening program of the winter spring season. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our museum members and those tuning in to our live web broadcast at 911memorial.org slash live. Before we get started, I wanted to let you know about the eighth annual 9-11 Memorial and Museum 5K run or walk and community day, which will take place on Sunday, April 26th. It's a wonderful day and I encourage you all to go online and sign up. The 9-11 attacks fundamentally transformed how the United States approached terrorism and led to the unprecedented expansion of counter-terrorism strategies, policies, and practices. While the analysis of these developments is abundant, there remains a significant void. The diverse actors contributing to counter-terrorism increasingly consider and engage women as agents, partners, and targets of their work. Yet, flawed assumptions and stereotypes remain prevalent and it remains undocumented and unclear how and why counterterrorism efforts evolved as they did in relation to women. Tonight, we are here to discuss A Woman's Place, US Counterterrorism Since 9-11. This new publication traces the evolution of women's place in US counterterrorism efforts through the administrations of Presidents Bush, Obama, and Trump, examining key agencies like the US Department of Defense, the Department of State, and USAID and interrogating US counterterrorism practices in countries such as Iraq, Afghanistan, and Yemen. We are fortunate to be joined by author of A Woman's Place, Dr. Joanna Cook. Dr. Cook is a senior research fellow at the International Center for the Study of Radicalization at King's College London, an adjunct lecturer at Johns Hopkins University, and a senior research affiliate with the Canadian Network for Research on Terrorism, Security, and Society. And she has recently been announced as a non-resident fellow at George Washington University's program on extremism. She holds a PhD in war studies and an MA in conflict security and development. We'd like to thank Dr. Cook for sharing her time and insights with us. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dr. Joanna Cook in conversation with Executive Vice President and Deputy, Di Deputy Director for Museum Programs, Clifford Channon. <laughs> Thank you very much, Ruth. Welcome back to our new season, everybody. I see many familiar faces and many unfamiliar faces. And for those unfamiliar faces, let me urge you to consider becoming members of the museum and supporting this program. There's a table outside where you can do that, thanking our members who are here, many of them I see, uh, because this is how the programs do get supported. So thank you for considering that. And I'm thrilled to be able to start our winter, spring, spring seems a long way away, it's, a, it's theoretical at this point, um, our winter, spring season with Joanna Cook, who really has taken on um, in her very interesting um, and comprehensive book, a critical question about how the counterterrorism fight, which is now coming on 20 years, incredibly enough, uh, how it has changed because of 9-11 and the role and uh, the understanding of women's roles and place, if you will, uh, in that fight on all sides, various sides of that conflict. So let me ask to start, um, can you give us a summary statement that describes overall what the change has been from pre 9-11 to post 9-11, knowing of course that even post 9-11 things have evolved? Of course. Uh, and first of all, a big thank you to, to you and the 9-11 Museum for having me tonight. It's, it's such a great opportunity to be here. But, you know, counterterrorism did not begin at 9-11. It's been, it has been a key part of U.S. foreign policy for many, many years. It's also been a domestic focus for many, many years prior to. And I think one of the, uh, one of the very interesting things in relation to women and counterterrorism is that they've very often been just generally neglected from this space. In the book, I look at women as agents, partners, and targets of counterterrorism. And whether it was uh, women within the actual practices of counterterrorism, whether it was uh, women in partner communities or countries that were being engaged in counterterrorism relation, um, like in foreign policy uh, work or US uh, efforts abroad, or whether it was really understanding women's roles in uh, terrorist organizations themselves, there's been such a, a lack of analysis and understanding of the very diverse 
uh, roles that women can and do play in this space and just how to shape those uh, counterterrorism policies uh, appropriately for uh, such audiences. Uh, what happened after 9-11, we did see a lot of that start to shift. And there are, I think, a number of reasons, a couple kind of key turning points for that. Uh, so whether it was the, um, the uh, 2006, there was an effort to start focusing more on training and equipping foreign partners. So all of a sudden, how women were getting trained and equipped in foreign uh, military forces and foreign uh, security forces took on a little bit more recognition. We also saw a lot more uh, focus on preventative efforts, CVE efforts, countering violent extremism, start coming up over the years, particularly after 2007. And there was a, there's also been a big increase in trying to think more about how you can engage women in, in these communities to counter extremism in their own uh, backyards, in their own families in some cases. Um, but simultaneously, uh, we saw shifts in women's roles in, in terrorist groups themselves. We saw, and this really, really came to the forefront under ISIS. 2014, we saw thousands of women from around the world going from countries like Canada, from the US, from the UK, from South Africa, from China. Uh, and women's roles within jihadist groups themselves started to take on a lot of, uh, a lot more recognition. So I think these are really some of the key kind of turning points that we've seen where um, a recognition of women's diverse roles in this space has really uh, gained a lot more attention as well. Now this, this happens in the context of pre-9-11 in particular, this sort of global focus on women as actors in development, mm -hmm. women as actors in political democratization. I mean, there's a period of time, uh, probably tracked most likely from the fall of the Berlin Wall, mm -hmm. when there is the opportunity in the room, let's say, to focus on this issue. Mm -hmm. But it really is very different to take that approach mm -hmm and move it into a counterterrorism context. Then you now have the possibility anyway that mm -hmm. women, perhaps not alone, but talking here about women, are now sort of instrumentalized in some way mm -hmm. towards the greater goal of defeating this terrorist threat. Mm -hmm. Is that, a, a it's a factor you talk about in mm -hmm. your book, but you know, how does that change what the focus on women had been previously? Yeah, and I think it's it's important here to also take a step back and look at the wider kind of global environment at this time. Uh, in the year 2000, the UN uh, established UN Security Council Resolution 1325, so it's landmark resolution on women, peace, and security. And there had been a momentum to really increasingly recognize and emphasize women as agents in all aspects of international peace and security. And so there already was a broader kind of global recognition that women's roles in relation to peace and security mattered and it needed more international recognition, more support. And we did see this start, we did see this start to kind of trickle down to the national level. 9-11 happens and when you start looking at what international peace and security looks like following, some of these narratives start merging in, in unique ways. Simultaneously, the US was starting to emphasize uh, a democracy, uh, the role of democracy promotion in its own work. And again, many of these narratives, things like uh, women's rights, women empowerment, things that uh, kind of fell under that democratization uh, sphere previously, start becoming um, pulled under that uh, umbrella of countering terrorism in ways that we really hadn't seen before. And so in the book, whether it's things like women's healthcare programs, women's education, uh, empowerment work that was being done, or training women as uh, security practitioners, all of these uh, initiatives in, in some of these countries where terrorism was a, a growing concern, really became seen in new ways. And you saw a lot of the programs, again, to do with things like, with everything from health to education to empowerment, political uh, participation, become framed in relation to how it contributed to uh, countering extremism in that community and ultimately help uh, prevent terrorism as well. And how did the programs change as a result of that different perspective post 9-11? Yeah, let me, let me give you an example to kind of outline this. So uh, in the, the book, Yemen is one of the countries I looked at quite extensively. And I had a chance to speak to a number of uh, U.S. ambassadors to Yemen along the way. And the U.S. has been doing programming in Yemen for decades. And a lot of that really had to do with things like women's development, education, uh, even things like healthcare. Um, and what was quite interesting following 9-11 was that all of a sudden Yemen became framed in terms of its potential threat from terrorism. We, we know there's many links to Yemen from, uh, from some of the 9-11 hijackers themselves. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula is uh, from Yemen. And we've seen a number of plots originate from there. And so Yemen has really been viewed through a counterterrorism lens uh, since 9-11. A lot of the programming that 
was being conducted in the country, then started taking on a new kind of a, a new little veil. So all of a sudden, if you were an ambassador in Yemen, if you wanted to get funding for a program, if, uh, if you were trying to get funding for something like a development project, healthcare, you had to be able to demonstrate that that helped counter extremism in the country. And actually, so you saw programs that very much were in the sphere of development, humanitarian aid, um, or uh, just broader uh, positive kind of political relations uh, and dip uh, diplomatic relations being framed in these new ways that I think we really are still struggling to, to fully comprehend. So many programs and so many areas of work in this field have really started to be emphasized in terms of now countering violent extremism or how it addresses things like the underlying drivers of uh, extremism in a community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, one of the things that is very striking, even before 9-11, but after as well, mm -hmm. um, in the American intelligence community is the role of women, particularly uh, in the hunt for bin Laden and the fight against Al-Qaeda and so on. Some of you may know, some of you will not know, we have an exhibition downstairs, a special exhibition on the hunt for bin Laden. And many of the interviews that we did with some of the key analysts going back pre 9-11, but continuing up to this day, uh, very senior people who had critical roles at various stages of the hunt uh, and continue in the fight against Al Qaeda and ISIS mm -hmm. are women and yeah. promoted and in position of responsibility and so on and so forth. Is it unusual, do you think? I mean, why did that happen anyway, yeah. even if there wasn't at any point a particular focus on that? Yeah, I think if you look at the field of security and defense more broadly, it has generally been a fairly unfriendly place to, to women working in there. That's starting to change over the years. But intelligence strikes me as one of these areas where it's been viewed as almost like a softer area of security and one that's been much more welcoming and open to women. And the intelligence... Uh, the field of intelligence is actually, I think, one of the areas where you can even see women uh, disproportionately represented. Sometimes over half the workers in, uh, in an intelligence unit are, are women. The bin, Laden, uh, the bin Laden exhibit really, really captured that well, I think. When it comes to actually a kind of feet on the ground, boots on the ground, uh, more uh, physical security roles that can be taken up, this is where you see a lot more resistance, I think. And we still see a very disproportionate number of women in everything from police, military, and certainly uh, frontline combat roles have, have been the most limited. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I do want to play. We have, um, uh, for this exhibition, we did an interview with um, Letitia Long, who, uh, for the hunt on the day the raid happens, is the director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, which is one of the key component agencies of the American intelligence community, which has the responsibility essentially for the interpretation of overhead imagery, whether from satellites or drones or planes or whatever it is. It's, so it's not cameras on the ground, it's uh, eyes in the sky. And uh, as she says, um, you'll hear from the first clip we're gonna play you, number one. Uh, she was given really this uh, extraordinary opportunity, both as the first woman to run an intelligence agency, but also the first civilian to run an intelligence agency. So I will let you listen to her speak here. First of all, what an honor to be asked to lead the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. And while many um, made a lot out of the fact that I was the first woman to run a major intelligence agency, I thought it was equally, if not more important, that I was the first civilian to run a combat support agency. And while General Clapper ran this agency when he was a civilian, he was a retired three-star Air Force officer, Lieutenant General Retired Clapper. So the first civilian to run an agency was as, as much an honor. I'll ask you after the second clip, then gives her response to this issue of being a woman in this role. So please. I was very cognizant of the fact that I was a role model and continue to be a role model for our young women in the community. And I'm very proud of that and do all that I can to mentor young women in the community and actually to bring young women and men into the intelligence community to serve our nation. Women played a key role in the UBL operation from an analytic perspective. So there you have, you know, the first 
um, in this extremely important role in an agency that had a huge piece of the bin Laden hunt. And she's talking about that mentoring role and, of course, being a role model herself. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, her case is a really useful one for reflecting on a little bit, too, because we are still breaking those barriers in, in many, many fields. Uh, we are still seeing a lot of uh, women taking up very senior roles uh, for the first time ever. Many have still never seen a woman. We've never seen a, a female Secretary of Defense in the US, for example. Um, we do see that in other countries, but you know, even being based in the UK right now, for the first time, all of the top uh, policing uh, positions in the entire country are being held by women. And so this is something we have seen uh, kind of evolve over time, but it really does also speak to just how far we still have to go. Mm -hmm. We've come a long way, but there's still so far to go. And I think the, the significant benefits from really having women integrated into our uh, security and defense forces, full stop, there are so many benefits to be had. Um, and I only look forward to, to seeing more women kind of take up these new roles. The current director of the CIA is a woman, and yeah. many of the senior leadership around her are, are women as well. Mm -hmm. um, coming more specifically, and, and you know, the case she makes, and we'll play the third clip in a minute, mm -hmm. is that by its very nature, Intelligence work is well served by having diverse perspectives looking at a particular set of facts or intelligence materials. Let's hear the, the third clip. We all bring our backgrounds. We all bring our experiences to anything that we do. And having women and men from very different backgrounds is what makes for good intelligence. When you get those different perspectives, when you get someone who says, what about this? And no one else on the team has thought about it. That's what women bring. So um, I'm curious how your sense of how this appreciation mm -hmm. of what different perspectives bring to a particular problem set mm -hmm. How difficult was that to penetrate into the intelligence community, do you think? Well, you know, one of the things I did with the book, I, I reviewed about 500 documents and did about 40 interviews with, with senior folks. And a lot of the things that she's just said, justification for why women should be included, were ones that really resonated throughout the wider community. And so, for example, there was the idea that, it, you know, the inclusion of women really increased things like uh, your operational capabilities. It gave you more effective... Uh, uh, more effective teams, uh, and uh, alongside this, um, uh, you know, women's roles in society, men's roles in society, they're gendered. They are, uh, your lived experience as a man or a woman in a society is going to be very different based on the country, context, time, and period. And what that means when you have uh, women who are half the population also represented uh, within your own forces, uh, within your own intelligence services, means that you see that uh, you get those perspectives from all corners of that community. The way that I you know, have grown up in, in Canada, for example, in, in my lived experience as a woman is going to be very different than somebody who might have grown up in Toronto. But that means that we also, if we're brought into the same intelligence agency, we can see the world from, from different perspectives. We can bring diverse viewpoints. And again, as she says, the more perspectives, more skills, the more uh, diversity you have within that, I think the the better you see the world in its, in its very uh, complex and nuanced ways. You know, we do um, programs here for different agencies of the intelligence community. They bring uh, some of their people here to tour the museum and have a special program. And I will say, in the years that we've been doing it, it's, it is noticeable mm -hmm. to see the diversity of the faces in the audience. And so um, it's really quite striking, and it seems obvious that this now I, mean, I don't know the numbers, but just from the visual impression, mm -hmm. there's a real expansion. Now, the final clip from uh, Letitia Long actually cites a specific example of how a particularly, uh, particular perspective provided by women, as she describes it, made an important contribution to assessing some of the intelligence about the Abbottabad compound uh, when they still were not sure who was in there and trying to figure out is this bin Laden? Is this the, the group that we're thinking it is? So you can play the fourth clip, please. So a good example is the laundry. We knew from the amount 
or we figured out from the amount of laundry being done that there were more than two families. There were more than just the two brothers who owned that land that were living in that compound because they knew how much laundry was being hung out to dry on a continuing basis. Not that a man couldn't have figured that out, but a woman figured that out right off the bat. <laughs> so we're laughing, and it's funny, but it's also true. Yeah. And, but I think that really goes to, to speaking again uh, about the kind of gender, uh, the constructed roles that men and women have had in society. And so if it's traditionally been women that have been tasked with things like household chores, doing things like laundry, then that means that they are more likely to be able to, to perceive that things. And as she said, it doesn't mean that a man can't also pick up those things. And thank God we see more men doing laundry these days. But I'm kidding. I actually <laughs> like doing laundry. I, I wanna, I'm not trying to make a statement here, but yeah. I, it's just that it relaxes me. Go ahead. No, no, I'm, <laughs> I'm kidding. But, um, but I think what that really shows is that, again, that very lived experience as a man or a woman can bring very diverse perspectives. And that those are things that are consistently changing and evolving in our societies. And again, when, when those diverse perspectives are, are represented in the security community, the intelligence community, and the defense community, I think there's nothing but positive, uh, positive aspects that can come out of that. It also seems that you know, as US forces are in Afghanistan, are in Iraq mm -hmm. with strong Muslim cultural traditions that you know, male soldiers, foreign soldiers, whether American or allied, mm -hmm. interacting with women mm -hmm. is essentially taboo. Mm -hmm. And so not only does the role of women in the American and allied militaries take on a greater importance, mm -hmm. but as you write, now these local forces, whether police mm -hmm. or military, are very unusually for these circumstances, creating women units of police and military because in their context, it's also only women who can interact in certain ways with civilian women. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think this is very different than what we'd see even uh, you know, in a place like New York or again, Canada or London. You know, in, in some sensitive circumstances or where culturally appropriate, Sometimes it's just easier to have women engaging with women. Sometimes women are more likely to engage with women on, on sensitive topics. If you're doing something like a body search, you know, I don't care if you're in New York or in Yemen, it's still more appropriate or more comfortable to have a woman doing that, right? And so when you don't have that, uh, that capability, it means that you can't access intelligence from that community. If there's concerns that they have, if there's things they're seeing that you, you might not uh, note otherwise, you don't have access to those perspectives. You don't understand the needs, the concerns, and uh, uh, the abilities of that full population and how you could even work together to counter some of these in a more uh, cohesive and effective fashion. It's, it really, and, and these, these female units in these foreign uh, forces yeah. actually did have very active and important roles at various points along the way. Yeah, and there's so many that, uh, that I ended up covering in the book. But to give you an example, in uh, 2009, there was an all-female elite counterterrorism unit set up in Yemen. And it was so interesting to hear about why this unit was uh, established. But essentially, because al-Qaeda had started kidnapping foreigners uh, in the country, a lot of the uh, house raids that were being conducted to, uh, to deal with this concern meant that when they were going in, if there were women in the house, they couldn't talk to them, they couldn't search them, they couldn't do anything. And these, this women's unit was essentially set up to follow after they'd gone into the house and deal with that population. We saw this with the, in Afghanistan with the, uh, the family support platoons as well that were uh, new units of Afghan women that were going in with special operations forces on these house raids as well. Uh, Daughters of Iraq program that was set up. Uh, it was kind of shaped off the, uh, the more famous uh, Sons, of, uh, Sons of Iraq program. And again, a very kind of similar role where having women engage with other women was so much more culturally appropriate, but it meant that you didn't have that gap in security you would have had otherwise. It meant that you could ask and gain intelligence and get a better understanding of what was going on in that space. And in fact, in some of the cases where women themselves might be perpetrators or moving goods or, or other problematic uh, roles that they played, women could then also engage with women who were potential security concerns as well. Mm -hmm. So it really made for much richer uh, operations. But Again, there are many, many problems with some of these units, including a lack of sustained support. Uh, mm. You know, a lot of these units are no longer standing or have were only stood up for, for a short number of years. But uh, many of the programs that have been set up, 
specifically to support women in these roles or to try and bring them in no longer exist. So that raises the question of the other side of the coin, of course. Uh, women associated with Al-Qaeda or yeah. later ISIS, the security threat that they pose. Mm -hmm. How did that aspect of the problem evolve over the course of time? So mm -hmm. in those early days post 9-11, uh, I don't really think there were a lot of women involved on the front lines with the Al-Qaeda fighters and yeah. so on and so forth. But over the time, uh, over time, things do evolve. And then with mm -hmm. the emergence of ISIS, mm -hmm. it really is a very different picture as well. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, serving these uh, these 19 years there were a couple instances where women really stood out. The first was under uh, Zarqawi in Al-Qaeda in Iraq, kind of 2005 to 2007. That was the only branch of Al-Qaeda that actively utilized women as female suicide bombers. And insurgent. he was uh, the way that they would recruit some of these female suicide bombers, and this is something that's covered by, uh, by Mia Bloom quite a bit, is looking at uh, the use of things like rape uh, and shaming these women into then you know, volunteering to go, be, go be, to go become suicide bombers. Um, so it was a really kind of horrific case of where you saw women actually utilized more in, in uh, combat roles. I wouldn't even say combat, but as a suicide bomber. Uh, Islamic State was such a game changer in this field. We know that women have played roles in political violence throughout history, whether Tamil Tigers, the FARC in Colombia, some of the leftist groups, uh, the German Red Army fraction, uh, uh, faction, Italian Red Brigades. Women have played roles in political violence throughout history. In jihadist groups, this has tended to be more limited. but. ISIS was very unique in many ways. ISIS was beyond just a, a terrorist organization. It was an insurgency. It was a state building project. And I think that state building component really impacted how and why women's roles became as expansive as they did. When you're building a state, you need women to become mothers, wives. You need women to interact with women in, uh, in public settings, such as healthcare, education, and policing. And all of a sudden, you saw thousands of women from around the world being mobilized and attracted to this group for very, very diverse reasons, some of which did take up uh, policing roles. For example, the Alhansa uh, policing unit uh, that was set up in Raqqa of uh, women to police other women. But for example, when, uh, when, Raqqa, uh, when the city of Mosul was being taken back as well, there were uh, a number of uh, female suicide bombers that were deployed. I think it was about 38 of them in a period of a couple of weeks, some of which were going and doing these, carrying their children. Mm. Um, and so while those were more limited roles for women, uh, they were a case of women themselves actually conducting violence within these groups. A lot of them had very limited or complex roles within the organization in other, in other uh, capacities, but um, it doesn't mean that they couldn't as well themselves be violent actors conducting uh, some pretty horrific violence. ISIS in particular, it seems, used women as marketers or publicists yeah. for the state, targeting women overseas mm -hmm. and painting a very positive picture of life in the caliphate mm -hmm. so that they would come and add their numbers to the group. Absolutely. Women played everything from propagandists. They were recruiting. They were disseminating propaganda. Uh, they were playing roles throughout the entire uh, caliphate. And, you know, I think one of the most frustrating things about looking at women in this sense is I've been looking at this uh, since about 2014 now. and. You know, even in 2014, we saw small numbers of women going, and I was like, so what roles are they playing? And I started to look into this more, and there was a consistent line that, one, it didn't really matter that women were going, and two, they're probably just going as wives and uh, mothers, or, you know, they're being duped into going or, or groomed. And there's been such a neglect of understanding that women play very complex roles in these organizations as well, and in fact, they might make the willing uh, choice to go and, and support an organization like this for very diverse reasons. And that lack of analysis of women's diverse roles in ISIS meant that up until 2018, before me and my colleague Gina Vale put together the first global data set to look at uh, the numbers that actually went, mm -hmm. we didn't even have a clear idea of how many ended up going. Um, and what we were able to de determine from our data set, we looked at over 80 countries, and only half of them had even recorded numbers for women. Doesn't mean that women were not going from them, but only half of them had even bothered to how do you that. explain that? Is that is that a blind spot? I mean, it, it's obviously important to know who's going yeah. and, and count them. Mm -hmm. But you're saying many of the countries that were sources of, of origin mm -hmm. uh, for some of these people in general, I assume, women included, uh, they weren't even counting those numbers? Because they weren't on the front lines conducting some of the, the worst atrocities, it didn't matter. There was a, a focus on those who were on the front lines and a lot of focus on those male figures. And up until this day, we still do not have a clear figure of how many women actually went and joined ISIS. 
we were able to demonstrate at least the 13 to 16 percent of those that went were women. But again, that's only accounting for half of the countries because many of those just didn't even bother looking at those numbers. And I, I would imagine your numbers, if they were if they were tending in one direction, they tended to underestimate the problem rather than overestimate it. We believe that that is probably a vast underestimation still, but we can prove at least 13 to 16 percent. So let me, um, you and Gina Vale had this very interesting article from the CTC Sentinel from West Point mm -hmm. last uh, summer. Mm -hmm. uh, it's entitled From Dash to Diaspora, number two, the challenges posed by women and minors after the fall of the caliphate. And mm -hmm. you document this very extensive problem, which I think has been in the, in the news, mm -hmm. uh, which is to say the political structure, the territory held, mm -hmm. has collapsed and leaving behind tens of thousands of people, mm -hmm. most of them women and children. So I'm going to, you, you describe three trends here, and I'm going to, yeah. we'll go one by one and mm -hmm. ask you to talk about them. So you say, beyond the fall of the caliphate, three trends have prompted a re-examination of the status of Islamic State-affiliated women and minors. Mm -hmm. First, due to the group's duration of occupation, an increasing number of Islamic State-affiliated women have born children. So this is, Islamic State is their homeland, so to speak. Yeah, I think the... The case of Shamima Bagoom from London really captures this well. She went over as a 16-year-old girl. She subsequently had three children. She lost three children. She had a husband while over there. You know, she was over there for a period of about, well, she remains over there, but she had traveled over there in 2014. But many of the women we saw go over had maybe, you know, some of them in, had taken children over, but had then uh, borne multiple children over there as well. And what we saw when, is when we were looking at even countries like Belgium, up to 81% of the, ch the minors that they were accounting for in Iraq and Syria were now born over there, right? So we, we accounted for, uh, I think it was around, I have to double check our data set there, but I believe it was about uh, 12 or 13% of those that were taken originally uh, were, were minors. Hmm. But what we've seen over this period of time is that many of these women had multiple children and all of a sudden we're dealing with uh, now an influx of a very innocent uh, victims. These children have had no say in, in the circumstances in which they're put in, but it also means that their identity with uh, with our home country of, of Canada mm -hmm. or Belgium or the U.S. Is, is starting to really spread thin. They might not even have that identity, and the only identity they may have is that affiliated with this organization, ISIS. Very, very problematic, and when we look at the Syria and Iraq right now, we can look at Northeast Syria at the Al Hol camp. This is where uh, a majority of these foreign women and minors are still being held. You know, the camp itself holds uh, over 60,000 individuals still. Many of those are uh, Iraqi or Syrians, but there's just about 10,000 uh, third country nationals there. And those are women and minors. Uh, and again, those are women and minors that have been over there now for, in some cases, up over six years. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it's a very dangerous place for these children. Uh, it's not dealing with any of the long-term consequences of potential radicalization or other kind of traumas that they've suffered. And we're really not doing anything to provide justice, or, you know, in the cases of adults over there. We're really doing very little to provide justice to the victims of ISIS who have really suffered uh, the most under this duration. The second factor you talk about is a significant number of women mm -hmm. remained with the Islamic State until its final stand in Baghouz and now require varied responses. Some are devout battle-hardened members, while others may seek to leave this chapter of their life behind them. Yeah. How do you sort them out? I think we still have a, a very difficult time recognizing that women with, associated with ISIS are very diverse, they're very complex. Not all of them are, as I mentioned, some of them have conducted violence, some of them certainly have, they should be tried and prosecuted to the full extent of the law once repatriated back to their home countries. But, uh, some of them as well have played more limited roles, more passive roles, and perhaps uh, in a way to most effectively deal with, again, this very diverse and complex population. We have to also account for things like how can they be de-radicalized? Uh, in some cases, it's better to try and de-radicalize them and reintegrate them back into uh, societies in ways that, again, uh, are very conscious of what those who have lived under ISIS have suffered and providing justice to them but also thinking about the long-term implications of, of what happens to these populations and how we best recover from this period as well. So it's a balancing act between really making sure that those who have conducted wrongs over there are tried and prosecuted to the full extent that we're able to, while recognizing that in some of these cases, alternative approaches might be better suited for some.
you know, you make clear that um, the home countries are quite confused about what to do with this, have very different approaches. Yeah. Um, I want to talk about de-radicalization efforts next, but, um, you know, describe the range of home country responses to mm -hmm. the reality of hundreds or thousands of its citizens, mm -hmm. young women with children in many cases, yeah. are at loose in the world and somehow have a claim still, if they wish, mm -hmm. to go back home. Yeah, so there's been two countries that immediately jumped to mind who have been a lot more proactive in this space. And, you know, out of all of the very well-funded and able-bodied uh, uh, countries that are out there, very well-functioning democracies, the two that have really jumped out have been Kazakhstan and Kosovo. So Kazakhstan, but Kazakhstan has, uh, you know, in three separate operations, uh, removed the women and minors from these camps in Syria, taken them back to Kazakhstan, done a de-radicalization and program. They've prosecuted some of the women, uh, but they are looking a little bit more at how to reintegrate them or deal with these populations long term, and particularly bearing in mind the needs of these children, hmm. which I cannot uh, overstate enough the importance of doing this. Kosovo has also done something similar in the way that uh, they have brought their populations back. They're uh, conducting trials for some of these individuals, but again, thinking a little bit more about things like de-radicalization and reintegration. But when I, you know, I do this in the book and I do this in my work consistently. When I look at women within these organizations, I, continu I continuously, consistently look at this in relation to them and counterterrorism efforts as well. For example, looking at things like de-radicalization programs, how do we understand women and how we construct de-radicalization programs? If we're looking at uh, programs that can lend to disengagement of women uh, from terrorist groups or individuals from terrorist groups, how are the needs or concerns or, or unique gendered aspects related to women accounted for in those programmings? And we're still falling so short of that. And that means that we might have a de-radicalization program, for example, where uh, you might think that somebody's, uh, you know, becoming less of a radical because they wear makeup again or something. You know, very, very simplistic and mm -hmm. limited understandings of how we can think about those gender dynamics and the roles of women and also this kind of de-radicalization and disengagement space. Your sense of these de-radicalization programs, mm -hmm. are they effective? Is one approach doing better than yeah. another approach? Is it entirely dependent on the country of origin and its, yeah. its cultural context? I mean, how are these things working? Are they effective? The difficulty with, with de-radicalization programs, in particular relation to individuals' lives now, is that we're really being quite responsive with these. And so, uh, for example, if you look at a country like Germany, they've been doing de-radicalization or, uh, or exit programs for, for example, from neo-Nazis for, for decades. Uh, and we do have like a, a longer history of, in some countries, including the UK, of how we uh, de-radicalize individuals. But, and this is something that I talk about in, in my classes at Hopkins, but there's, there's a big debate in this field whether when you leave one of these groups behind, do you change their entire way of thinking? Do you cognitively de-radicalize them, change their entire worldview? Or do you uh, focus on behavioral disengagement, make sure they don't conduct violence? They can still have some of the, uh, the views that they hold, but as long as those views do not uh, drive them to actually conduct violence in a society, is that acceptable? Um, and so this is something you see slightly tailored in each of these programs, right? Mm -hmm. um, but again, I think one of the challenges that we also have is when we look at de-radicalization programs. If you look at um, if you look at criminals in prisons more broadly, recidivism rates, whether you go in for murder, whether you go in for uh, robbery, fraud, there is always consistently a, a level of recidivism. There's always going to be a component of people who go back and, and conduct that again. And mm -hmm. we have to recognize that no program is perfect. You will never have 100% success. Uh, that's a, it's a very difficult thing if you're a government and you can't guarantee 100% success of, right. of these um, for very clear reasons. But there are programs that have been demonstrated to be effective in having people find more uh, constructive ways of addressing their concerns or, in fact, really reorienting their lives and away from what was this, this group, this ideology, this uh, belief system, and, and really kind of shaping their lives in new and more constructive ways. You can't imagine, though, the pressures on a government when a failure occurs at some catastrophic level of a bomb or an attack of some kind mm -hmm. from someone coming out of one of those programs. You know, being based in London, we've seen three in the last couple months. Folks that have uh, exited prison after being in there for uh, terrorism charges and have gone on to conduct uh, attacks. Actually, one of those was within prison. Um, 
One yeah. was at a de-radicalization conference, if I remember correctly, and, and mm -hmm. he launched his attack from, from that conference site. That was the, the London Bridge attack. Yeah. Uh, and I don't disagree with anything you're saying, and I think it's a very difficult thing as a politician um, to, to allow for in these individuals who have perhaps served their, uh, their sentences um, and who, for all intents and purposes, appear to be completely de-radicalized, released into the public, mm. who then go on to conduct attacks. This is a very difficult thing to address politically. Um, but this entire field of counterterrorism is always a very delicate balance of the rights of society, the rights of the individual, uh, how you conduct and ensure the, the security of your society more generally. There's always such a, a delicate balance of these uh, aspects uh, to be had, and we've we've not necessarily, I think, found that right balance yet. You mentioned before the German efforts at de-radicalizing neo-Nazis, and, and I'm wondering, you wrote about it in other contexts and make reference to it. How would you compare uh, the role of the use of women mm -hmm. in these Islamist jihadi groups mm -hmm. as compared to right-wing, white identity national groups? Is there a comparability there, or is it really two different concepts of where women should fit in? I think this is such an interesting and timely uh, question to look at. And if anything, the last 18 years have shown us that we really have to understand women's very diverse roles in things like jihadist groups much more than we than we have. But when we look at the, the roles that they've been playing in the far right, you know, whether it's women's historic roles in the KKK or whether it's some of the more contemporary terrorist uh, or groups that are now listed as terrorist organizations, Things like women's roles in the domestic sphere tend to be quite emphasized. We tend to see large uh, streams of things like misogyny in these groups, uh, debates about women's roles in actually taking up violence or you know taking up arms on behalf of the group. All of these also transfer to the far right as well. Mm -hmm. And you know one of the things I find most fascinating and that is still completely underanalyzed in this field is, is the role that gender plays. And so when we talk about uh, when we talk about women, we almost consistently associate that with gender, but. Things like a, a hyper-masculine identity or the idea of what a man's place should be in, in this world as well plays very much into how somebody like Andres Breivik will, can go pick up and mm -hmm. you know, set off bombs and pick up guns and go conduct an attack on behalf of this ideology, right? So I think there's so much to be gained, again, from really better understanding things like uh, the role of gender in this space as well, not only for women, but, but for men as well. And many of the lessons I think we've learned over the last 18 years or lessons that have been more visible over these last 18 years are very applicable to looking at some of the evolving concerns today, of which women in the far right are certainly one of them. But some of the new uh, issues that we have coming up as well, like whether it's looking at uh, the role of artificial intelligence or um, cybersecurity, there's all of these new spaces where really better understanding how women can be better uh, integrated into the uh, into the programming itself as actors that actually conduct those operations and, and get involved in that work, but also understanding how those, um, how those aspects of security impact on women or, again, maybe how even women in violent extremist groups utilize some of these spaces and places in ways that we might not still recognize or understand fully. So you've got um, very close experience in three Western countries. Mm. If you're from Canada, you've mm -hmm. done this study, which is principally about American policy. Mm -hmm. You're in the UK as well, and you've studied there. Yeah. How do you compare those three countries' approaches to the issues that we've been talking about this evening? That's a, that's a very long, <laughs> that's a very long response. Um, it, you know, it's interesting because each has a different history with terrorism, right? And so in Canada, we've had, I think at one point, we had the highest concentration of diverse terrorist groups. Um, present within the country. The biggest terrorist attack that we've dealt with was the Air India bombing that killed uh, multiple hundreds of individuals. Um, you know, in the U.S., uh, we had the, the FLQ in Canada as well uh, that, uh, that conducted a number of attacks uh, a couple, a few decades ago now. In the U.S., there's been a lot more domestic terrorism as well. We've seen, you know, the Oklahoma City bombing was, I think, you know, pre-9-11, the most impactful uh, case that was, that was seen here. Um, what domestic terrorism looks like has been very unique in each country. You go over to the UK, uh, North, you know, the, the IRA played a significant role in, in what counterterrorism has looked like and how that's developed uh, domestically. Um, so each has kind of dealt, there's two levels. The first level is nationally, domestically, and each has dealt with a very diverse set of concerns within their, their home country. 
But in the kind of post 9-11 world, we've been much more interconnected with some of these global threats and some of these mm -hmm. global concerns. And uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS have been two of the, right. the most prominent. The rise of a kind of global far right and particularly violent offshoots of that is now a growing shared concern as well. Mm -hmm. And are the countries, uh, given their individual approaches or backgrounds, mm -hmm. it would appear that they're cooperating much more closely than they ever have before. I think, I think that's something that is necessitated by the interconnected and global nature of a lot of these threats. These aren't necessarily uh, localized organizations that have no, um, no reach to the outside world. They are, in many cases, networks that are connected across multiple countries. They're an online community that can uh, be set up in the U.S. and connected to multiple countries around the world, right? Um, so by virtue of things like the increased use of technology, the, the global nature of a lot of these organizations and, and ideologies, borders don't matter in the way that they perhaps once did. And a lot of these concerns are shared global concerns and they're interconnected in ways uh, that they just never have been before. We do need to ensure that we work together and more closely, more closely um, to address a lot of these issues. And is this sort of interactivity of uh, national intelligence agencies is it creating a more nuanced appreciation or approach to the varied roles of women in relation to the problem of counterterrorism? Or has that not really managed to cross this divide? I think there's been a lot of catching up and a lot of kind of hard inward uh, kind of soul searching in terms of how we've, how we've recognized and understood women's roles in political violence. ISIS has really, I think, shifted uh, shifted that conversation in many countries because whether it was France, Kenya, we've seen multiple families in Indonesia conduct attacks. We've seen women who have uh, claimed an ISIS belief or associated themselves with ISIS ideology actually try and commit uh, attacks or have successfully carried them out. Uh, for example, three families in Indonesia who did that. Mm. Uh, a group of 10 women in Morocco who uh, had an election plot. Camp, uh, an election plot. Um, a group of women in, in Paris who uh, tried to set off of a car bomb at Notre Dame. These are all women that were associated with ISIS and there's been a hard reckoning that actually women may be inspired by this ideology in diverse ways and some of them may be willing to take up action on behalf of the organization. But I think again, that's been very responsive as opposed to proactive. It's, it has been in response to seeing these actors come up. Again, Tashmi Malik in, uh, in the San Bernardino attack is probably one of the first cases in the US where a woman has uh, associated with the jihadist ideology conducted a mass scale, uh, you know, mass scale violence like this. Um, but, it, you know, women remain uh, the lesser actor. They aren't the ones that are primarily carrying out this violence, but it is important to recognize that they can and do support it in, in certain ways. And we do have to be cognizant of the threat that some of them may pose in certain circumstances. Am I right in thinking that ISIS has been much more flexible theologically, ideologically mm -hmm. in allowing or, or, or approving mm. of the role of women as terrorist actors mm. as opposed to support behind the scenes and so on. Yeah, so remember that ISIS is, is a global movement right now. And so what they were doing in Iraq and Syria and the territory they held meant that women could be uh, in the police force there. They could be in the Al Hansa Brigade, for example, policing other women. Um, or in limited cases, again, they could go be things like suicide bombers. In all of the other plots where women have been involved, uh, and that plot has been either inspired by ISIS um, or related in some way to ISIS, none of those individuals were from Iraq and Syria. They, had, they were all from that home country and were either, again, inspired by ISIS and the ideology where ISIS themselves or you know, ISIS leadership or ISIS figures in Iraq and Syria did not necessarily direct those attacks. But these were individuals that, of their own behest, were, were willing to go take action on behalf of this organization. They were inspired by them and decided to go take action. Um, in some cases, we did see uh, family members or individuals they knew in Iraq and Syria. But again, in none of the cases that I'm aware of have women who have returned from Iraq and Syria conducted attacks. Mm -hmm. So it also speaks to the kind of ideological inspiration that ISIS as an organization has provided for, for some individuals as well. Okay. Let us see if we have some questions from our audience. I will ask you, here come the lights. Um, raise your hand and wait for a microphone. Gentleman takes the first step. Good evening and thank you. I wonder as we embark on this journey and, and have Middle Eastern nations uh, by our side in the struggle, if we can 
now in uh, two decades of retrospect, look back on some noteworthy female leaders of, of, who have been really deserving of special mention in this fight. I, Benazir Bhutto comes to mind, I think. Um, are, are there others? You know, Benazir Bhutto is a, she's a great example of, uh, of a woman who's really kind of taken up a leadership role in, in, a, uh, in a country that, well, from Pakistan, uh, and so in a country where female leaders are not, uh, have not been very common. But many of the countries we look at, and I think it, in some cases it doesn't necessarily have to do with, with singular uh, leading figures. And in fact, whether looking at, again, Yemen or Iraq or Afghanistan, for decades you've had women across the entire country. Some of them have been in policing forces. Some of them have been trying to move into things like the intelligence and defense areas. Uh, but we've also seen women's groups on the ground, you know, continuously over these trying to lend to things like the development of their communities, do things like uh, conflict negotiation communities, or like uh, sustainable peace in their communities. And so a lot of these uh, cases might be smaller, they may be more localized, but I think in many ways they are the kind of unrecognized individuals that really deserve a lot of recognition because they have been from these communities, they have been putting in a lot of work, uh, and they continue to in places like Iraq, Syria, Yemen, and Afghanistan. Um, so in, in some ways, it's maybe not necessarily identifying the, the leaders. Of course, there are many, and some of the female uh, politicians coming in Afghanistan, um, women who have been working in things like uh, conflict negotiation in, in places like Yemen, they all deserve recognition. But perhaps what can be most effective is recognize it. What could perhaps be most efficient is when we see and understand the diverse roles they already play in their communities uh, supporting this work, how we can perhaps better support them or give them the tools they need to, to really take this work forward as well. Another question here in the middle, hang on for the mic. Who's going to bring the mic? Thank you again. Um, this has been really awesome. Um, <clears throat> I was wondering, in what ways do you think women are still being underestimated in these areas, both you know, as agents, partners, and as targets? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think we still have not fully recognized the, the roles and contributions that women can play in all aspects of security and defense. Um, and again, when you have uh, security forces and defense forces representative of that population, including the 50% that is women and very, very diverse women within that, it means you have a, a stronger understanding of the community, the needs, uh, and the, the potential responses that could be most effective. And we really have not got to the point where women are being engaged adequately in this space, and I think we're still falling short in our societies for that. Simultaneously, when we're looking at uh, women in other countries that we're partnering with, whether it's uh, training and equipping foreign forces, and I think training and equipping uh, women in foreign forces is probably one of the areas that we have still fallen short in. A lot of these units that were being set up, or whether it was trying to train and recruit women for the Afghan National Police or the Afghan National Army, have really fallen short. And the importance of women uh, in these security forces is just as important as it is for our society. Um, we're still playing a catch-up game from ISIS and trying to better understand the roles of women in, in jihadist groups as well and how we deal with these populations today. You know, some of these women are young mothers, some of them were girls when they went, some they're, you know, they're now adults, some have committed violence. Uh, you know, they're very, very complex and diverse, and how we tailor our approaches to them uh, on a case-by-case -case basis is something we're still, again, very, very limited in. Um, and I think there's a lot of implications that come from that, but you know, the bottom line is we still fall short, kind of full stop throughout this entire field with how women are engaged in all aspects of this, understood and supported. And, all aspects of this work. I see a lot of young women in this audience, and I'm really hoping that many of you will go kind of take the lead and start taking up more roles in this, this very excellent and worthwhile field. Let me ask about um, the uh, impact of women and their, any change in their roles. Mm -hmm. With the fall of the caliphate, does it mm -hmm. increase the risks? Because mm -hmm. now everybody who is sympathetic needs to be mobilized and pose whatever threat they can, mm -hmm. or has it sort of stabilized in some way, do you think? I think both Syria and Iraq are in a very tricky and a very delicate place right now. And a lot of the uh, circumstances 
that led to the rise of ISIS in the first place have not been adequately addressed. Um, you know, again, looking at this, the current situation through the lens of women, we saw Kurdish uh, women in, for example, um, uh, Kurdish forces in Iraq on the front lines, you know, fighting and dying alongside their male colleagues to, you know, to protect and defend their communities. We saw women going with the YPJ forces in Syria. And this is the first time, as far as I'm aware, that women were mobilized on the front line com in frontline combat to the extent that they have now. So what does this mean for their roles going forward? Will they continue to be integrated and supported in wider security forces in the region? It's an open question. You think about women who have now suffered under ISIS. You know, Some of them have been forced to live kind of five, six years under ISIS and are now rebuilding their communities in, in ways that have very limited means going forward. The idea of reconstructing and stabilizing some of these areas is, is daunting, to say the least. And so also being able to recognize the needs of women who have survived this period and what can be done to kind of support them and the work they need to do to go forward and help rebuild and sustain their communities is something that's important to recognize as well. But also, you know, some of these ISIS-affiliated families. ISIS is now morphing into an insurgency locally and the roles of women in insurgency is increasingly recognized, whether it's moving goods, moving weapons, raising the next generation of kids to perhaps be recruited into this. We also have to recognize that women uh, do pose a, a concern going forward. Um, and ISIS has, on multiple occasions now, identified the importance of these families in their own work. And you know, you can bet that they haven't just forgotten about them in, in our whole camp now. And the longer that these populations just sit there and you know, for all intents and purposes, do, it is going to be a lot more problematic to deal with them in a constructive way going mm. forward. It is amazing how the problem seems to morph, mm. you know, from obviously from circumstances, but it, it finds a new expression. Absolutely. Yeah. Another question. Gentleman here. Michael. Hi, this has been fascinating. And earlier you mentioned um, that there should be or there's potential for greater study of gender mm -hmm. in, in this terrorism. Yeah. What, what, what do you think we would gain from the possibilities there? Absolutely. And so I'll also preface this by saying, you know, if I was talking about gender in relation to security circa 2014, half of the, you know, half of the audience would generally fall asleep, kind of nod off or start, you know, fiddling around. It's, but I think there's been such an increased recognition of the importance of it because what that gender lens offers us is you get a clearer sense of why a man or a woman in that place or space might be attracted to a certain ideology, what kind of benefit or gain or sense of belonging they might find by joining a group like this. It means that when you're uh, trying to create preventative work, like countering violent extremism, for example, you know how to tailor your programs for, for men or for women. It means when you're conducting uh, counterterrorism work, you don't just focus necessarily on the men, but you understand that women too might have a, a role to play within that. It means that when you're doing community engagement work and trying to work with these communities to better uh, counter extremism in them, it means that you can engage women in their diverse forms as well as men. And again, that kind of whole of society approach is better reflected, integrated, and considered in how you do that. Um, and I think if we've predominantly focused on men and the needs of uh, the needs, the drivers, uh, the roles of men in this space, it really has neglected how we understand not only violent extremist groups full stop, but the very um, diverse and nuanced ways in which we can counter them more effectively. Uh, and so I think there's operational benefits to it. It reflects the needs and concerns of that population more. And it also means that if you're looking at counterterrorism through a human rights approach, you don't unintentionally violate the, the rights of, of perhaps women on the ground in a way that you might not consider if that gender perspective is not taken into account. And Jane Huckabee is a really excellent one who's done some work in this space and, and really emphasized that uh, gender lens in relation to human rights and counterterrorism. But I think those are the things that I would uh, say more, more predominantly. And um, again, something as simple as having communities or members of the community who might be much more willing to engage with women in security forces, provide intelligence, or highlight issues of concern in their communities that could help prevent some of the bigger problems down the road, it just means that there's a lot, that preventative aspect becomes a lot more efficient, engaging with the, the concern itself becomes a lot more uh, effective, and how we recover from and stabilize societies following an attack become a lot more sustainable and reflective of that needs of the whole population. Thank you. One more. In the back. Go ahead. 
Thank you very much for speaking to us tonight. Um, I wanted to go back to something you were talking about earlier mm -hmm. on the difference between um, CVE or terrorism prevention programs mm -hmm. in terms of one approach being de-radicalization, change, uh, change of ideology versus, I suppose, demobilization, change of behavior. And mm -hmm. I just would love to know your thoughts on that and mm -hmm. I guess the realities and effectiveness of, of either approach and where you're mm -hmm. kind of leaning on that debate. Yeah. And it's a great question, and I think that there's importance in both spheres. And both spheres, you know, at the end of the day, uh, if you're focused on security, if you're a police officer, if you're in the military, you want to focus on ensuring that security is maintained and preventing somebody from conducting a violent act. You know, and that's that's of the utmost importance. And when you get into the more preventative space, trying to change the way people think can become a bit more contentious, right? It, that becomes thought policing. That becomes the kind of big brother approach, and it can be a very sensitive area to get into. But I think there is also ways that you can focus on preventative work in ways that is constructive and helps reduce the number of people that might funnel down into these groups. And so it's about, again, kind of finding that balance between how can you do this constructive, positive, preventative work, change the way people, perhaps not change the way people think, but influence in a way or give them other options. You know, if you've got a grievance, instead of picking up a gun, you go start a political campaign. You go find a more positive outlet for taking that grievance and doing something constructive with it you know and those are areas that i think are a lot less contentious but it's always about finding that uh, that important balance between that kind of thought policing big brother approach and really giving people who might have very legitimate grievances a more constructive outlet for uh, for dealing with them and again that's something that perhaps we tend to focus a lot more on the the direct security point of it but that preventative space is a lot harder, a lot more sensitive, and one that we still don't focus on enough. It's really important work, and um, you know the nuances of it, and you know just the, the layer of complexity that it adds is somewhat daunting, frankly, because it's difficult enough, and now you're finding more difficulties. But uh, it's only digging through this all that you know we have at least the hope but I think of there's finding a solution. So but there are so many solutions to be had, and there's a lot of really important lessons I think we've learned over the last 18 years, and I do have a lot of hope uh, that we can learn from those, and again, make more uh, effective uh, approaches to security that reflect the needs of the population, that reflect those populations, and that can in fact make us safer at the end of the day. A Woman's Place, U.S. Counterterrorism Since 9-11. Please join me in thanking Joanna Cook. Thank you.